I have joined us again. Tonight's session is titled Mapping the Holocaust. We're joined by Ann Knowles, Professor of History and Geography. I, I actually need to correct myself. This is Dr. Ann Knowles. Uh, she's do, joining us from the wintry and cold uh, uh, northern part of our country at University of Maine. And again, our TA tonight is Howard Hunter, who's at Metairie uh, Park Country Day School. I think several of his colleagues, uh, Suzanne and Nanette, are here. Um, and he's going to be in the chat box dropping in resources that he's curated. Uh, first, uh, Anne, I need to thank you for being here. Can you hear me? I sure can, Andy. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Anne, for joining us. And, um, you know, as has as become the custom, I'd like to begin tonight's session before I turn over the PowerPoint to you with a question of my own for you to sort of frame the night and set the tone. Um, and, and, you know, after, uh, I'm not sure if you remember, we probably met about a decade ago in, in a variety of work we've done uh, with teachers. And I know as an educator, particularly at the collegiate level, um, you wear these dual hats. And it does it right here on your slide, professor of history, professor of geography. Is that schizophrenic for you? <laughs> Is that hard to sort of approach things from these two very distinct disciplinary places? Oh, Andy, well, um, thank you for this question, which is the question of my life uh, or the story of my life. Historians don't know why I love geography and identify as a geographer, and most geographers similarly don't understand why I'm smitten with history. What I'm stuck with is that the two for me are inextricable. And I came to this, well, I fell in love with both of them at the same time many years ago. Now it's approaching three decades ago. Um, I was working as a book editor in Chicago and I met a man who was the first historical geographer I ever met. His name was Michael Compton. Turned out he was one of the great historical geographers alive on earth at that time, but I didn't know it. I just thought, well, this is an interesting Englishman who knows an awful lot about maps and has an unusual way of telling history, that is, telling stories about the past through maps. He and I worked together for nine months, very intensively, developing a new map program for a U.S. history survey textbook. It's still in print in, I don't know, it's 13th edition or something. And in the course of working on that book with him, I finally was excited about history because mapping history made it real. It literally brought it down to ground for me. And I began to see everywhere I went through those bifocals um, that a past place was in, or a place was interesting because of its past, and history was interesting because it took place. So uh, I'm afraid I've been bicameral ever since, and I find it keeps history constantly fresh because there are so few of us approaching history in this way that there's always new work to be done, new questions to answer. It's, it's a lovely answer, and I also uh, like the very deft way that you changed schizophrenic to bicameral. You're absolutely right. <laughs> Um, but, but, you know, history is, you know, largely based in time. It's temporal. And geography is largely seen as being, um, as, as being place-based. So, you know, if, if what we're encouraging our audience to do tonight is to see the, the true interdisciplinary nature of what you're going to share, um, are there some really clear ways that geography and history speak? Is it the storytelling? Is it the narrative style that maps actually tell? Um, I'd say no. I think many people working on the geography side of this divide or this bicameral uh, universe are trying to find ways to tell stories with maps that go beyond presenting the spatial layout of a story mm -hmm. and make it narrative. Text still has the great advantage of being able to tell a long and complex story. You think of a novel and how you can be gripped and you, you're sitting on your sofa for five hours until you get to the end of it. Maps rarely do that, but I hope with the final example I have today, I'll show how the folks I'm working with and I are trying to get a little closer to that goal for mapping. Fantastic. Well, we're really anxious to hear that story and, 
Uh, the slides are now in your control. What I'll do as the moderator is to bring questions as they appear and as they make sense in the flow of the conversation, and we're anxious to learn from you. Okay, thanks, Andy. Well, um, the, if Andy remembers uh, our first meeting, I hope he'll recall that I tend to go off script, and I, I've been that way uh, throughout my academic career, and I am going to immediately go off script because uh, partly because I do not, I'm not able to show animations in this presentation, which is fine with me because it opens up time for us as a group to talk about what interests everyone. This is just to give you a heads up. I won't be doing the fourth item on this slide, visualizing events in time. That's an animation that I can make available, I think, to Andy as a resource that you guys can consult later. The other way I want to go off script is that I want to circle back to some of the wonderful chat that was going on uh, while we were getting set up about movement. As uh, one of the things I've always loved about Andy is his creative, fertile mind. And I didn't know until this evening that he was going to set out a question for everyone to think about related to movement. I'm a dancer. I'm a former dancer, but I still kind of am a dancer. I, I can't help but move, and I love movement. And in the context of the Holocaust, movement is actually a whole new area of research that's just beginning to open up, partly as people map uh, especially Holocaust victims' trajectories through the Holocaust. But there's also a fascinating new idea that I hope to spend time on during my sabbatical beginning in January on the issue of spatial agency, that one of the forms of violence that the Nazis committed against all of their victims was robbing them of spatial agency, robbing them also of place and the ability to control where their bodies were, where they could live, of course, where they could work. But thinking at a little more conceptual level, if place is presence and movement is spatial agency, then the additional violence that we've just begun to think about is denying people spatial agency, their freedom to move, and robbing people of their right to assert a presence, uh, to be fully alive as people in the places they wished to uh, inhabit. So I, I got really jazzed seeing the comments, and maybe those are themes that we can come back to. What I have provided uh, in my slides this evening that I would love to share with you folks is going to break down into three broad geographical concepts, which I will illustrate with various examples, most of them maps, from the work that I've been doing with an international interdisciplinary group. We call ourselves a Holocaust Geographies Collaborative. We first got together in 2007 at the Holocaust Museum, and many of us have been working together ever since. First, I'd like to look at the idea of location. This is uh, really the, the core concept, the first concept in geographical thinking. Where are things located and where are they not? What are spatial patterns? And here I'd like to use as examples SS camps and ghettos in both space and time. Two other, these two elements also we find in our work really can't be separated. Then situating people and actions or events in relation to the built environment. This is one of the uh, geographical concepts that I think is especially rich for teaching kids because kids are so aware of their environments. They are such live social beings, hyper aware of who they can get close to, who they can't, what places are safe or unsafe to go and so on. Um, so I hope we'll have some good discussion around that with some examples related to one particular ghetto and one particular camp. And lastly, I'd like to turn to the question of narrative uh, which is really where GIS can begin to run into some trouble and prove to be inadequate. How do you map personal experiences? So I will dive into my first set of examples about locating uh, with examples from SS camps first. Um, the historical geography of SS camps and ghettoization has been the core of my own work with the Holocaust Geography 
Collaborative for 13 years and counting. This first image you'll notice near the bottom left of the slide is credited to Eric Steiner. Eric is a brilliant geovisualizer and cartographer out at Stanford, and uh, his use of a database to suggest the nefarious, powerful, destructive, continental system of SS camps is one of the favorite images from our book, Geographies of the Holocaust. More conventional mapping is where we started in studying SS camps. I think it's, it can be really important when you're approaching a, an historical subject that has not been mapped very much to lay out the basic geography of what was where. This uh, trio of maps already begins to bring in a little bit of time. This is, uh, these are, are three moments in the expansion of the German Reich from February 1938 to September 1, 1941, the invasion of the Soviet Union. The orange territory is the boundary of the Reich as it expands. But the content argument really of this set of maps is that the, the concentration camps that the SS controlled and administered always remained within the Reich. There were many, many other places, of course, um, involved in the Holocaust, but this particular set, the most familiar and perhaps the most important uh, camps were within the Reich, and there's some interesting historical reasons for that. Andy mentioned GIS, and we're going to be, I'm going to be using a lot of GIS examples. Here's really one of the first. I said it was important to figure out where things were. Well, back in 2008, when our research group really got going with some NSF money, uh, we decided that it would be important to map the location of all the SS concentration and labor camps. That's what this map represents. Here, each major camp or main concentration camp is a larger dot. I hope you can pick out some of those names, Dachau, Flossenburg, uh, Hinset, Stutthof, to the east, and so on. And the smaller circles are the labor camps associated with the main camps. And the, this map, I will quickly make one really important point about showing this geography. It was an enormous system. Um, this isn't all the camps, but still just under SS management, it stretches from the Rhine all the way up to the Baltic. Uh, on the border of the Soviet Union. You can then, once you've built a database of locations with their attributes, including time and association, you can begin to show them in other ways. This is something called a viewshed, uh, excuse me, not a viewshed, this is a straight line um, analysis that really just connects the labor camps to their main camp in these sprays uh, of color. And what this begins to show right away that the previous map, I think, is not, is the geography occupied the territory more or less under the control of a certain camp. You might notice in the center of the map, more or less, the orange spray is Buchenwald, one of the largest camp systems, uh, which has a, a, an approximate east-west orientation, which partly follows some major highways through the central part of Northern Germany. Um, and another uh, little spray I'd like to draw your attention to is Auschwitz. In the middle of the map on the right-hand side, those light blue lines, not nearly as large as system, much more constrained socially, which might be a bit counterintuitive because Auschwitz is so familiar and we think of it as such a huge place in the Holocaust, but it almost literally has its back to Eastern Europe Again, because only SS camps were within the Reich, but it's receiving prisoners from all over. So another thing that maps can do in teaching is generate discussions about what people see that is surprising or leads you to ask, well, why is it like that? And why is that one long golden line from Sachsenhausen running deep into Eastern Europe? Turns out at the end of that longest golden line is the city of Kiev, 
where there was one labor camp associated with Sachsenhausen. What was that about? So you look for the patterns and you look for the anomalies when you can see these kinds of visualizations. Just two more slides in this part, and then I'd really love to open it up for some discussion on this first, set, first idea of location. Locating places in space is one really important step, but locating them in time is also incredibly important, whether you're teaching history or any other subject. This is a different visualization of exactly the same data as was in that first dot map of all the SS camps. But here, we're seeing when camps opened. The black dots, we think of this as our computer punch card graphic. This was made in Tableau, by the way. The black dots are the openings of the main camps. So you might be able to see the furthest left black jot is Dachau, which was the camp outside of Munich that Heinrich Himmler uh, took over as first the chief of police in Munich and then rapidly going up the Nazi hierarchy. It was there that he worked out his system, his approach to incarceration and violence against prisoners. Next was Sachsenhausen down uh, near the bottom of the chart and on it goes. The bright red orange jots are the opening of camps, most of them labor camps. And you can see the enormous concentration of openings in 1944 and early 1945. That's when the Nazis losing the war were desperate for manpower and began to pull more and more camp prisoners into all kinds of factories and armaments manufacturing to try to keep the war effort going. So the last image I would like to show you is also a combination of places in time. It's this one. This is one of our newest visualizations out of a project I've been running now for about two and a half years on the historical geography of ghettos in the Holocaust. This was made by an undergraduate at UMaine, Jeremy uh, Braun. And Jeremy is a wonderful example of a crossover student. He was an earth sciences major who got excited by one of my history classes where I had all the students make maps. He thought it was really cool. He loved making maps. And he ended up being a history minor and a very important member of my team. So this is Jeremy's visualization of two events. In red, German occupation in a couple of the many regions that were studied. And in blue, when a ghetto opens, each line here horizontally relates to a particular ghetto, when the Germans occupied the place, and when the ghetto was established and how long it lasted. Thinking of a narrative of both places and time, I've included here the two greatest extremes. On the left is the story of long occupation and relatively long ghetto life in Poland, in the Wartegau and Krakow in particular shown here. And on the left, excuse me, on the right, the terrifying, horrifying, tragic brevity of German occupation and most ghettos existence. In Lithuania. I think there may be a lot of ideas already there. Andy, shall we pause for a minute and have some discussion? Yeah, let's do that. And uh, with your permission, I'm going to go back to your first, uh, uh, not that one, maybe this one, um, for the conversation. Uh, let's go to the, let's go to this guy right here. So uh, we're really curious, I'm really curious, and I, I'm struck by your invitation as a geographer to look at patterns for both anomalies and for trends. Um, I, you know, in some ways, you could not be a scholar of the Holocaust, and you could, you could not have, you know, a really deep understanding of, of the places and the names and all the details to look at something like this and ask some really interesting questions. So I wonder in our audience, yeah, you know, if you look at this map, our audience, 
what kind of questions come to mind? Um, what kinds of things do you see that you either are curious about or that you wonder if there's an explanation for? And, and we're going to pause for a moment and let folks type their questions into the audience chat box or the Ask Professor Knowles box. Um, I'm just curious, what, what do you as, as folks see in the, in the map that's been created here? And we'll pause for just a moment. And that audience chat box is the one with the green border. Take a look, maybe zoom in on your screen if you can. The questions pop up. You know, one question that occurs to me, and uh, sure, Amy, Amy has asked me to repeat the question. If you look at this map, this visualization of the data, what questions do you have about what you see? What anomalies do you see or what trends do you see? Eric is noting that it was very widespread. Joel, that there's efficiency. There's very little overlap of the lines. I think that's a really uh, interesting thing to note. Mm -hmm. um, there's more camp area, Jeffrey notes, than he thought. Jordana's wondering uh, if there's if these camps are working together, and I, you know, mm -hmm. I see that the upper right hand corner there's some yellow uh, representation that seems pretty far away. Where is that? Why is it so far away? Very systematic. Uh, Allie McCursey, uh, good colleague in New York City, notes that she's struck by this vast system and how it demanded an extensive bureaucracy to maintain. What's the culpability of the bureaucracy? <laughs> Very organized, very organized. Movements of the prisoners on each camp. These are some really fascinating uh, questions and observations that you're bringing up, you, the audience. Uh, here's mm -hmm. a question for you, Anne. Wh where did you get the data that is sitting behind these maps? Great question. I'm so glad you asked because uh, for two reasons related to collaboration. The original data behind this map and uh, most of those I've shown so far came from the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. I mentioned that our group began working in 2007. We were invited to a couple, a couple of us before we were in any formal uh, group were invited to um, organize a workshop in the summer to bring together people from different disciplines interested in using geography to study the Holocaust. And we, the group that uh, I and some of my colleagues, now good friends, brought together turned out to be so productive and, and we got so excited that we kept going uh, with the encouragement of a number of scholars at the Holocaust Museum who then became great uh, colleagues and helpers for us, including by providing information and locational data, uh, really important, from their ongoing Encyclopedia of Camps and Ghettos project. Then at Middlebury College, where I was teaching at the time, I worked with a number of undergraduate students to check all the locations of camps, to correct them, and to begin to build out a database with more and more characteristics of camps so that we could analyze things like where did women work? Where were families sent? Uh, what sorts of labor did um, forced work, forced laborers uh, do, and so on? And that was really the beginning of my understanding of the Holocaust was through mapping it this way. That's fantastic. Uh, we do have quite a few questions now queuing up. So, with your permission, I'll just I'll sort of organize them in a in a particular way and bring them to your attention. The first is a basic question. This is from Lucia. She asks, what does the color coding represent? <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, Lisa, it's not coding. It is the use of a select number of colors so that they are visually distinct. So there's no significance to the colors. 
um, it would right. be an excellent thing to add a note to that effect on this map. So thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, here's the next question. This one comes from um, from Kayla. Kayla asks, "Why does the uh, uh, Sachsenhausen why does Sachsenhausen have the most long arms and overlap with the other hubs?" I wish I knew. Um, I'm afraid this map is both one of my favorites and one of those that pesters me the most uh, because I don't know. I, the one thing I can tell you is that uh, Sachsenhausen was located uh, just outside of Berlin, and it had a lot of connections, all, or its commandant um, had a lot of connections to the top hierarchy in the SS and the Gestapo. That's about as far as my knowledge goes, but my, my mm -hmm. suspicion is that the Sachsenhausen commandant was sort of cherry picking where to send his workers. Uh, the SS profited from the, the uh, sending of forced labor or some say slave labor. The workers, of course, almost never did. But that is a great question that really should be followed up by somebody. Anybody want to join the team? <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's a question from Eugene. He asks, uh, and perhaps, by the way, Anne, you might know this just in your own context, or this map might be able to uh, to address some of these questions. Eugene asks, did the Nazis aim to conceal the atrocities occurring in the camps by locating them away from civil civilian populations? That is such an important geographical question. I'm afraid, Eugene, it's another one that we have not answered specifically, but we have thought about it as we've been checking the location of camps and ghettos. Uh, we, we use Google Earth. We use other uh, online uh, websites that, that help you track places, and so you can't help but see where a camp uh, was in relationship to population. Most of the large concentration camps were outside of major cities, uh, but most of the large ghettos were smack in the middle of a city. So I think it's a very mixed story, and some camps did have uh, com some camps became killing centers, but many of them um, were not like Auschwitz Birkenau. They didn't have gas chambers and crematoria. They were really sites of labor. And so, how much people who lived nearby actually saw may not be quite as important as what they knew. And there is now almost no evidence supporting the idea that locals didn't know what was going on. People knew that lots of people were prisoners, that they were living in dreadful conditions, that the places stank, that uh, they were sending out slave labor to work for everyone in the neighborhood, and that people were suffering. Yeah. The great atrocities that you may be thinking of uh, really happened much more in Eastern Europe, and that's kind of a different story. Yeah. Here's a question from Robert. He asks, again, in reflection of the map and how it's represented, uh, how does this map capture numbers? Is there a line thickness expressing quantity? Oh, that's so interesting. No, where it looks thicker, that's an overlapping of lines. So, for example, in the Grossrosen, the sort of navy blue spray, and then the Buchenwald in orange, they look thicker because they were the largest systems that just have more lines going to more camps. Mm. And similarly, uh, and this is a, I'm going to conflate several questions and comments that have popped up. Do you have any sense that the lines of movement represented here map onto either a roadway or a train system? Not train systems. Um, and these lines, it, it's one of the problems with this map, wonderful as it is, it really doesn't show movement. It shows administrative relationship. Oh, um, got it. Yeah, so there would have been like a moment of movement when prisoners were sent from the main camp to the work camp. And in some cases, like at Gross Rosen, where there were work camps very close by the main camp, it would be a daily oscillation. But in most of these cases, prisoners were sent out and they lived at the labor site. Um, we are working on ways of representing movement. If I can come back, Andy, in a year or two, uh, maybe I can show that. Okay. Um, here's a question from Catherine who asks you to 
elaborate a little bit on that really long yellow line. And she asks quite simply, what was going on in Kiev? Yeah. Um, all that I've been able to figure out so far is that it was a single work site in Kiev. I think it was a small factory and just a few workers were sent there. It wasn't a major operation. But getting more into the detail, I'm afraid I, we now have someone in our research group who knows much more about um, the Ukraine than I do. But we're, the, the full answer, I'm afraid, is not yet available. I'm sorry. Let's we get together so I can answer more questions. Yeah. Um, here's a question from Ed. He asks, or he first reflects, that he thought uh, that he that there were more Jews in Poland. Is the relative scarcity of camps and smaller nodes because of the fact that the German presence there was not strong? Um, Andy, could we go to the map of all the camps? Yeah, you can move it yourself, Ann. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, that's all right. Just pick the one you want. Okay. Uh, this is the one I want. There we go. There so we go. here, um, there were some camps of so the, the spray map, the, the line of sight map that we've been focusing on is a subset of all the camps. Um, this is a, a more representative map. I mean, this includes all of the known SS labor and concentration camps. But when we get into um, ghettos, and that really, uh, I'm afraid because I can't show the animation of ghettos, that would be where you would see the enormous presence of Jews, Jewish communities, Jewish uh, places in Poland and countries further to the east and south. But it's an interesting point, Ed, because um, I think there, there are such powerful associations between Polish Jewish history and the Holocaust that we would expect to see camps in Poland. But the big story for an awful lot of Polish Jews was ghettoization and then being sent to one of a very small number of camps um, and extermination sites, the, the killing centers like uh, Treblinka and Sobibor, rather than being sent into the SS labor system. So it's it's a diabolically complicated story that uh, I think once our project uh, begins to get our results out in books and articles and more maps, then there will be a bit more balanced geographically with the big story of ghettoization in Eastern Europe, including Poland, and the story of camps, which is much more in around uh, the Reich as we see here. Fantastic. Thank you. Part of my job as the moderator is to keep us on time. So I suggest we move to the next section and then we can pause after for some more questions. Okay. Thanks, Andy. With this, um, I'd like to focus on a particular ghetto. This one, uh, Budapest, Hungary, is the special focus of my colleagues and dear friends, Tim Cole and Alberto Giordano. And I thank them for letting me share their work with you today. Um, Tim has been studying Budapest, uh, the Holocaust in Budapest for many years. He's probably the world's leading expert. And thinking spatially about this ghetto, he says it's helpful to realize that here the Germans and their allies brought the ghetto to the Jew rather than bringing Jews to the ghetto. And what this first image begins to show to explain that idea is that Jews lived throughout Budapest. There was never a single concentrated ghetto, let alone a walled ghetto space in this city. It was very different than ghettoization in the Polish cities that Ed and others may already know about, like the famous Warsaw ghetto that had a very big and, and imposing wall that kept moving. Here, Jews lived throughout the city and that led to particular kinds of experiences. Um, the roundup of Jews in Budapest was also much delayed. It wasn't until really the spring and summer of 1944 that the Germans cracked down and began massive deportations out of Hungary, including by the end of the summer out of Budapest. At any rate, here we're focusing on 
the spatiality of the ghetto, the spatial patterns, and how that affected people's lives. This was a distributed ghetto. And here I'm thinking about situating people in relation to the built environment. So I'll begin to show you that. First, uh, the dot map is where people lived, and this map um, is the streets that they traveled. Uh, the streets they almost all walked upon because Jews by the late spring of 44 were not allowed to ride in public transport. What Tim and Alberto did that I think was most unusual and began to open up a big spatial story was to use GIS to estimate how far people could travel, what could their daily movements be during a particular period of time. In June of 1944, curfews were imposed on all Jewish families. They were only allowed onto the streets of the city for three hours a day. How far can you walk in three hours a day? That was the only time when people could walk in relative safety to get food, for example. So here is a GIS estimate of the distance from every Jewish apartment or house to the nearest market hall basically a great big grocery store where people would buy their food, usually every day. In the pale yellow is a 30 minute estimated distance. Then uh, for, for, so the little purple dots are where people lived. So in the pale area, anyone living in that area could get to a market hall and back home in the safe period of time. In the more uh, buff color, there you're getting out as far as an hour each way from home to the hall and back. That begins to be dangerous because once you get to the market hall, you're going to be standing in line. You have to go from the bread seller to the meat seller to the potato, the potato lady. And by the time you get back home, you might be pushing outside that curfew time and you might be at risk of arrest or even being shot. This also affected with a different kind of geography, people's access to hospitals. And this, if you think of a, a city in wartime when lots of elderly people especially are suffering, when women are still having babies in the hospital, but there may be complications, how do you get them food? You'd have to carry it. How do you get to the hospital? You have to walk. And the third story for which Budapest is particularly famous is access to the Swedish legations, uh, the diplomatic uh, representatives of Sweden were exceptionally active in Budapest, particularly the famous figure Raoul Wallenberg, who did so much to save hundreds of Jews' lives by getting them false papers so that they could escape from Hungary. So how close were you? How safe was it to get in line to try to get inside a Swedish legation? Here there are even more people on the outskirts of the city who wouldn't have had time to do that safely. So this is an example, I think, that brings movement, a special kind of salience for thinking about people's spatial agency and what they could and couldn't do, who was relatively safer or at greater risk. And my second example comes from Auschwitz. Um, Auschwitz, uh, my dear colleague, Paul Jaskot, art historian at Duke, thinks about our work on Auschwitz as visualizing the archive. And what is the archive? A set of architectural plans, hundreds and hundreds of architectural plans and building records because the architectural history of this enormous camp survives more intact than for any other camp. Here are a couple of Nazi architects at work, in fact, planning part of the construction of Auschwitz-Birkenau. Well, Paul used architectural drawings from this cache of surviving records uh, to try to figure out with GIS how much of the camp was built as it was planned and how much of it was sort of jury-rigged uh, at the last minute to meet the, the requirements of genocide. Here is a, an architectural plan for the beautiful garden city that some of those Nazi architects hoped to build at Auschwitz. And here is our GIS tracing of that map 
with additional buildings added. The purple, the four purple uh, rectangles in the lower middle part of the diagram are the most important to notice. Those were not on the original plan. They're in a space between the uh, apartment buildings and the sort of villas that the architects had planned. What those purple rectangles represent are barracks that were built in haste, mostly in 1943, in anticipation of trains bringing hundreds of thousands of Jews from Hungary. In other words, this is seeing not just what the Nazis dreamed, but what actually happened on the ground. Um, it gives me chills every time I think about it. And we would like to do this kind of mapping going forward, not just showing what were the Nazis talking about, what were they claiming, but what did they actually do and how did that reflect their priorities? Clearly, genocide was the top priority at Auschwitz by 1942. And here I have another pause, Andy, if we'd like some more questions and discussion. Absolutely. And, you know, I think, uh, first of all, I think it's a, a lovely transition from the scope and scale of a region and the spray maps and sort of this big picture to take, take this geospatial thinking down to a very personal level, how far you can walk, uh, the location of rooms and buildings. But I think you, what you've also shared is, the ways that maps can evoke emotion, right? They're not these static two-dimensional kind of flat pictures in a book that kids sometimes think, but I mean, you can look at a map like this and really get, just as you suggested, chills or shudders. Some, some folks in our audience chat have talked about the sort of the impact of, of seeing that. And I think it's a really important thing to underscore for mapping and maps. And they're very evocative. So, I wonder can I, can I just add a point, Andy? Um, because uh, this, I appreciate your your uh, graceful summary here. Uh, when this map was being developed, Tim Cole, one of the authors, uh, read to us a piece of testimony by a woman named Judith, and Judith was a teenage girl uh, in 1944, and it was her responsibility to get to the market hall and get the food every day. And she lived at one of those addresses on the far right side, outside of the beige. And she talked in her testimony about how she would have to run through the streets to get back home on time. So that's exactly the kind of storytelling that a map like this can provide background for, context for, and it makes her story all the more meaningful. You can almost imagine a girl running down those thin gray streets, desperately trying to get home. Absolutely. I, I wonder if in response to this set of maps, if anyone in our audience has a question they'd like to share or a comment. Uh, I've noticed several of you, Jeremy and Jordana, uh, are, uh, your families have, have survived the Holocaust. And, you know, this clearly is a very, um, a very personal story for you as well, but this this might be an interesting way to make the story personal for your students. The Holocaust is an overwhelming concept for all of us, and so, you know, your younger students who are trying to make sense of far uh, far away and long ago, this might be a way to really humanize it and, and personalize mm -hmm. it. Uh, Robert's asking a question. He asks, "How does mapping water and sewage lines of camps tell stories? Could you imagine that? And you haven't done it." I have not done it. I can imagine it. If I can go back to um, this Auschwitz plan, for example, I'm sure that there are plans of the sewer system. And for every camp, I know that there are notes about where the latrines were. Um, and Primo Levi and I think Elie Wiesel in their amazing memoirs talk about the distance to the latrine. Uh, and the difficulty of getting there on a winter's night or the luxury of being able to hide away from uh, the guard's eyes, uh, that kind of uh, detail in relationship to a plan for one of these famous maps, I think could do an amazing kind of transformation in kids' minds about those famous works of literature. 
Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, Abigail, uh, who is joining us from the Abraham Lincoln uh, Presidential Library asks, is there any benefit to using Google Maps in the classroom where you can look through the street view with the students, particularly if you were to map it on, uh, pun intended, sort of layer it onto a map like this? Oh, I think that'd be great. Um, I thought about more about using Google Maps after a visit to Dachau a year ago. It was my first time at that camp in over 30 years, and it made a huge impression on me. A lot of that camp remains today. I mean, the, the historical structures are still there. So that would be a, a fascinating place where you really could get a good sense of the camp scale uh, by using Google Earth. But then you could also use Google Earth in fascinating ways for the places that have disappeared, like um, Chelmno, one of the um, one of the destruction camps, um, one of the extermination camps. There's almost nothing. Um, uh, in fact, I don't think there is anything left on the built landscape. And likewise, uh, the camp in Germany, Bergen-Belsen, uh, which was liberated in '45, and all the famous photographs were taken. Those places were erased from the landscape. So going to a bare place on, on Google Earth and then having historic imagery or historic maps come up through that, that was very powerful too. Fantastic. Um, here's a question from Adriana, who's joining us from the University of South Carolina in Aiken. Uh, Adriana has, is asking um, if there are any plans that are that were unknown until now, plans meaning the construction, the architectural mm -hmm. plan. Were, were there any plans that were unknown until now that show the Nazis' desires that were not constructed? For example, were there plans for more horrific things that were not built? I don't know of any examples of that last point, horrific things that were not built. There is a continual emergence of all kinds of material, including plans and maps that individuals drew, both site managers for construction squads and prisoners. Um, and I'm thinking, I think it was just a couple of years ago that some prisoner sketches of, an, of one of the escape attempts from, was it Sobibor? I forget, uh, were found that shed all kinds of new light on what they were planning, what they hoped to achieve. So I don't know that there are any large collections of architectural drawings yet to be found. Uh, there are quite a lot of them and they're pretty well known, I think. Um, but the new material just keeps on coming. It's kind of like the American Civil War, another subject I studied a while ago. You think we know everything, but in many ways we're still on the cusp of learning so much more. It's interesting you bring up your work with the American Civil War as as another example in that, you know, as a geographer, then you're able to address these really overwhelmingly huge topics. The Holocaust and the Civil War are big, complicated topics, and you know, the, these visualization strategies help make better sense of them. Um, and it seems, too, that you suggested matching oral histories or uh, vignettes or even... Um, you know, the writings of the survivors uh, is also helpful. I'm really struck by this notion of, of you know, Elie Wiesel saying, you know, count literally counting how many steps it took to get to the bathroom uh, or to the place where he went to the bathroom, I should say, and be able to put that on the map. It really does kind of add a, an extra texture to the understanding. Yeah. Something I love to encourage uh, teachers at any level to consider that takes almost no technology at all. Find a map of a place, however large or small, that you think is interesting. Get your copy shop to print out a large copy of it and tape it up to the wall. And then encourage kids to come up and mark on it. it it's working on a, on a big paper map that you're allowed to violate that you're allowed to make your own or use sticky notes if you want to approach it a little more gradually. Um, it's just really fun and it, and it really gets kids thinking spatially in a way that looking at, at what we put on our own computer screens, I think, doesn't begin to match. Uh, 
Absolutely. Um, and we're at top of the hour. We have about 30 minutes left. So why don't we move to your third section? Okay. Well, speaking of uh, personal testimonies and individuals, that's where I'd like to go with my last set of uh, images. And this is under the heading I had at the beginning of when GIS is inadequate. As Andy knows, I'm a big proponent of using GIS and almost any kind of mapping method to get people thinking spatially, to work with historical information in a new way and so on. But with working on the Holocaust, my colleagues and I in the Holocaust Geographies Collaborative kind of hit a wall with GIS back in 2014. We were wrapping up our book called Geographies of the Holocaust, which included a lot of the images I've shown you so far. And it began to feel more and more sterile to us. We needed to bring people into our work much more explicitly, and particularly we needed to bring in victims. There's a certain similarity between the Nazis' cold, distant, unfeeling planning about taking over Eastern Europe, taking over all of Europe, and getting rid of all the people they didn't want in the way, a similarity between that, or it can feel similar, and the kind of instrumental cleanness, uh, precision of GIS. So these, these kind of troubling thoughts set our group off in the direction of working with Holocaust interviews, that is interviews with Holocaust survivors, um, there, as many of you probably know, there have been uh, a number of very ambitious, highly successful interview programs. The one that we've been most closely associated with is the Shoah Foundation in uh, Los Angeles, California, originally set up uh, with some of the profits from Schindler's List by Steven Spielberg. Uh, it has become a major Holocaust research center and a center for genocide research as well. They have interviewed uh, over 50,000 individuals uh, in many languages. We've also, we also continue to work closely with the Oral History Center at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC, and some of their affiliates. So out of our foray into testimony came some new ideas that I'd like to close with today. My dear friend and former Middlebury student, Levi Westerfeld and I have worked together for a number of years to try to find alternatives to GIS, a way of mapping that is closer to storytelling, that is more narrative. And we particularly have become fascinated by the question of how to map places that have no geographic coordinates, that is ordinary small places that don't show up on a reference map, that don't have latitude and longitude. The places may have disappeared or they may be so small and insignificant, who knows where they were? Or they were places where something traumatic happened and because it was traumatic, the speaker can't remember where they were. This is a particular problem, in other words, that comes when you listen to Holocaust testimony. The two people on your screen are the first two survivors whose testimony Levy and I spent a lot of time with. Anna Patipa, born Anna Lux, was raised in the Southern Carpathian Mountains um, at a place called Peretzin, the daughter of a fairly wealthy family. Her father was a businessman. She grew up educated with her sisters and was a lovely young girl when the Germans arrived in the early 1940s. Jakob Brodman happened to grow up in southern Poland on just the other side of the uh, Carpathian Mountains. They were about the same age, uh, he just a little bit older, when the Germans uh, changed both of their lives. Their stories are quite different, but both of them are quite rich with the mention of many, many places. Uh, that cannot be mapped, that have no, uh, you can't find them in a gazetteer, they, you can't find them on Google Earth. In other words, they're not geographical place names, but places that were important to them, 
to give you just a little bit of a conceptual frame for the rather strange map I'm going to show you in about two minutes, Levy and I got thinking about what are the ordinary places in our lives? And Levy thought, well, you can think about places, little everyday tiny places in relationship to one another. So if you think of the sentence, I sat in front of a desk in a barn on the coast of Maine. That could be represented as a series of places or it can be represented as nested relationships. There am I on the right-hand side sitting in front of a desk, which is inside a barn, which is in a town on the coast of Maine. This is actually thinking about our everyday speech as an example of the mathematical concept of topology. Topology is at least the way we're using it, it's basically the idea of relationships of objects in space. If you know that the desk is inside the barn, which is inside the coastal town, which is on the coast of Maine, you can draw those relationships and put those small everyday places in relationship to the one place that has geographic location, Maine. So, Levy, being an artist, started working in pastels to represent or figure out how he would represent these different size places in their nested relationships. And I'm going to go to this is the beginning of the map that we made with Anapatipa's town, Paracin, as the big circle, and then the little smudges of stronger or lesser intensity and opacity are different places that she mentions in her testimony, in her story, where things happened. The junior college school, we don't know where that is. It was destroyed. The bank, which bank? I don't know. Their house, well, we do have an address for the house, but is that what matters? Or is what matters that important stories took place in the dining room, in the bedroom, and so on? What we ended up making in the end was a map that we call I Was There, Places of Experience in the Holocaust. It's a series of circles. In the center of the map, the biggest circle is Auschwitz, where both of them ended up. And I will provide uh, in the resources that you can consult after this uh, some links to where you can find this map and study it much more closely. It's hard to make sense of here because the actual map is three feet tall and six, almost six feet long. Uh, it's one of those big wall maps. But we've also been uh, very delighted that a, a much more skilled artist and cartographer, um, Oliver Uberti, has picked up the map and done a new version of it in a book that's going to be coming out next year. Here you can see a little more clearly in green where Jakob Brodmann was the little arrows showing where he moved from place to place in the course of his truly traumatic experiences. And then Anna Patipa, who stayed in her hometown longer, it wasn't until, until 1944, as part of the Hungarian deportations, that she and her family were forced, uh, deported to Auschwitz, and then she ended up eventually in Bergen-Belsen, and so on. So this is a kind of story map of the Holocaust based on a new premise that maps of experience should not just include the places we're familiar with including in maps that have latitude and longitude. We also need to seek ways to represent the unmappable places where so many of our most important everyday experiences happen, and particularly in the context of the Holocaust, where life-changing events could take place. And those, those representations are really beautiful. Um, talk to us a little bit about the symbology that you chose. Um, you know, as a, as a map maker, as a visualizer, as a geographer, certain symbols are more powerful than others. Uh, tell us about the circle, for example, or tell us about the ways that uh, young people, young students can, you know, 
start to understand relationships based on the symbology? Andy, that's a really important question. In fact, uh, the symbology we choose to, to use in maps is one of the basic decisions for how you're going to try to communicate. Levy and I went back and forth for weeks and weeks about whether to represent places as circles or squares or triangles or just words. And we finally decided that we would use circles because they indicate some spatial extent of a place. We also decided that the circles should be relatively sized. So the biggest circle on the map should be Auschwitz. It's the largest on the ground of any of the places included. And it was the most important in their experiences, in their stories. But then other places here are shown larger circles than their actual relationship. And the point of the largeness of those other circles is how important the places were to the speaker. I also just want to draw people's attention in this particular example, sort of in the lower center part, uh, central part of the Auschwitz circle. There are some little tiny places marked with a cross. Um, there's doors and windows, for example. We were really struck listening to these two testimonies at how many really important events happened in a tiny space. And that's what some of those little marks represent. And how, Anne, did you also then um, represent emotion? So, you know, there's, there's place, even if that place is misremembered or not specific to a location there's place with there's some place it seems that might even be imaginary meaning places yeah. that places that we go that we don't really name but we all know that we congregate at this particular place because it's safe i mean you can it sounds like you can mm -hmm. almost map things like danger and safety and uh, mm -hmm. and survival absolutely and that would be so this map Strangely enough, given our goal, this map does not include emotion, nor does Oliver's rendering. This, these are actually quite abstract. But in future work, I hope to soon be working on a, a much bigger mapping project. I want to figure out how to map emotion. And I think that would be something kids would probably be much more intuitive and quicker to find solutions than an old lady like me. Um, give a whole bunch of crayons and a great big blank piece of paper on the wall and have them map the places of fear and freedom and hiding in someone's story. Have them draw the emotional spaces in Anne Frank's diary and I think you'd get some amazing results. That's really a, that's a, a fantastic connection. Um, we have a couple of questions that are coming in and uh, they're going to be a little bit random, perhaps, but I'm going to try to time together. Um, let's start by sharing with us, in your experience at least, how this kind of work has been received and how it has affected new scholarship and Holocaust studies. How, how do other colleagues of yours respond to this work? Um, Levy and I thought when we made this really strange, very large map, that it just would have no effect on anyone. And that was okay because it was our experiment. We were stunned when, first of all, our big map won first prize in the 2018 map competition at the Association of American Geographers Conference, which is a conference that draws 8,000 people, and there were hundreds of map entries. Uh, then it was chosen to be included in this book, um, which is going to be, uh, it's a book called Mapping the Invisible. And so our two survivors' experiences fit into that category. And I think what, what the reason our, our map and the approach that we've used here is striking a nerve is that so many people are realizing GIS is wonderful, but it only gets you part way. And there's so much interest now in storytelling and in visual communication that these two are now kind of colliding. And, and there are many, many people trying to figure out how to tell powerful spatial stories 
and we've provided some new concepts for them to work with. It's very exciting. And similarly then, uh, have you had the opportunity to share these maps with any survivors, with any of the actual stories that you were able to map? Anybody uh, perhaps at the Holocaust Museum in DC or others who could be, who could see themselves in the stories, if not, not literally, yet. yeah. Not yet, I would love to, of course, this generation is passing away. Both of these wonderful folks um, are no longer on this earth. Uh, but that would be a wonderful experience. I would like to connect with people in my state's Holocaust Museum, and I know there are some survivors who give talks at schools here. I would love to show them this map and see what they think. Uh, I'm looking at the audience chat for some other questions. Um, let's, uh, how about this, Anne? Um, let's let's put a finer point on our conversation about mapping emotions. Reina uh, has asked, are, what kind of data might you use to map something like emotions? Is this primarily, uh, you know, uh, journals, diaries, narrative entries, vignettes, personal writing, uh, memories? How, how, what kind of data would you use if you chose to map the emotion? All of the above. <laughs> people, people uh, speaking, writing from their experience. So speaking, uh, oral interviews, which both of these testimonies were, video interviews, uh, actually that's what these were, and memoirs. I think over the next decade, uh, I expect to see uh, just an enormous outpouring of narrative mapping. And it is catching on in Holocaust studies. I, for a couple of years now, two years next month, um, I've been running a virtual graduate seminar in Holocaust geographies with young scholars from around the world. And there are a good dozen people there who are beginning to work on these problems with their own material. I'll just give you one example. There's a young man from Holland named Don Deleu, and Don is mapping the experiences of forced laborers from Holland, from the Netherlands, who went from camp to camp to camp to camp. And each time they were sent to a new camp, they had to make friends again. They had to figure out who their enemies were. They had to find the safest place to work and who to avoid and so on. Uh, it's an astonishing piece of uh, research underway. And he's mapping all of their movements and he is including their emotions as they go through all those traumatic transitions. So I think we're gonna see more and more of it. And working from people's direct experience is, is as good as you can get, I think. Uh, I'd like to echo Lee Holder for a past teacher advisory council member. Lee is a teacher in Eastern North Carolina, and he notes that in many public schools uh, at the state level, at the district level, geography as an independent discipline has all but disappeared. Geography is really, uh, you know, was, um, has been has been removed from many of the curricula. Uh, from your perspective, Anne, at the university level, um, what can teachers do, if, even if geography is not specifically the discipline and part of the standards, what can they do to infuse geography in what they do teach? Hmm. Well, Andy, it almost makes me cry how uh, how behind the world we are in this country in not giving our kids the kind of geographic awareness that would make them much better, more sensitive, more aware citizens in the world. Um, but that's kind of another subject. The, my functional answer to the last part of your question is just get them making maps any way you can, paper and pencil, light tables, GIS, a uh, computer, Adobe Illustrator, anything at all. Spatial awareness and geographic questions almost inevitably develop through the practice of map making. And it doesn't matter how good it is, it doesn't matter how pretty it is. Things happen inside the brain when you begin to connect the neurons of spatial perception. So that's what I recommend. Just get them making maps on whatever you're interested in. And it, it may be that some of our participants tonight uh, signed up for tonight's session 
mapping the Holocaust because of the keyword Holocaust. And mm-hmm. then as, as they, they're here, they realize that we're really talking about mapping and geospatial thinking and visualization that you personally were not necessarily a Holocaust scholar until, and, and perhaps don't even consider yourself that now, except you're a geographer who's applied that to the Holocaust. T- tell me, tell us, what you personally discovered in your work in the Holocaust studies as a geographer. What did you realize and learn that shocked you that you just, you did not understand before you entered this project? Almost everything, Andy. I had no no background in the Holocaust at all. I hadn't read Anne Frank's diary because I didn't really like it very much. And uh, just as literature, it didn't interest me. And I, all I'd read, I think, was Ellie Wiesel's Night. That's about it. I got a telephone call from the Holocaust Museum in 2005 from someone who said, we hear that you use GIS for history. This was about the time that I was working on Gettysburg. And we wonder, do you think GIS would be useful for studying the Holocaust? And it was one of those moments when I felt the chills run down my spine, Uh, just a lightning bolt of recognition that this was the great good luck of my life. It's happened a few other times when I've fallen in love, but this was an idea that was absolutely astonishingly interesting. So ever since then, I, I am still a neophyte as a Holocaust scholar because I have so much catching up to do, reading the enormous literature. Um, I would say I've particularly learned about what's happened in Eastern Europe, and I've become enormously interested in Lithuania as a site of deep Jewish history and uh, enormous destruction during the Holocaust. So that's one of my particular foci now. Um, but I'm learning all the time, and I won't stop learning <laughs> until my life is over. This is an endless subject for me. And it seems that these maps not only visualize the emotion, but they also can help us model the emotion, particularly empathy. Say more what you mean about that, Andy. That's fascinating. Well, just in the sense that... Um, you know, em- empathy, historical empathy in particular, is something that we often try to or to, to model for our younger students. And uh, being able to uh, to connect the layers of testimony, memory, vignette, uh, uh, photograph, map, etc., just gives us a much richer and more three dimensional view of of these these issues. So. You know, I, I remember teaching night for many years as an educator, and, but that's just, that's text, right? And, and, and you can access that text in a particular way, but seeing the map that's on the screen right now allows us to access those same feelings in a much different way. Yes, that's right. And that reminds me another, uh, I think, great pedagogical value in getting students to make maps maybe particularly if you're not a geography teacher. Like I've spent much of my career teaching non-geography students how to make maps, is that that it will reach the kids who struggle with text. I've had so many dyslexic boys who who take to GIS like a fish in the water finally, Um, and shy girls who are nervous about their writing, but when they start drawing freehand spatial uh, connections based on something they've read, all of a sudden a new part of their personality blossoms. So in, in the age of visual thinking, this kind of graphic ideation, the, the rendering of, of spatial ideas graphically, can be really empowering for students. Uh, last question tonight is uh, going to go to Howard Hunter, who's our TA and a current member of our Teacher Advisory Board. Uh, Howard, again, is at Metairie Day Country, uh, Country Day School in Louisiana. And Howard asks, what kind of geographic skills do you think should be essential for teachers of history and the humanities? I'm just thinking so I don't make an enormous laundry list. <laughs> Geographic skills. 
Hmm. I I was once once I had a wonderful conversation with a Canadian historical geographer named Sherry Olson, and she'd been aware of what I was doing with Gettysburg and stuff before that. And she said to me, "Anne, you know you can't make them all into geographers." And uh, I think that's fair because the training, the formal training of a geographer takes as long as the formal training of a historian or anyone else. I think that rather than skills, I mean to just my power in a way, but rather than skills, I would think about curiosities, to be curious about place, places the place where you live and teach, the history of your town, that's a big one. That's a really big one. Opening up students' eyes to the history of their surroundings can begin a lifelong exploration. Uh, introducing yourself to maps, which really just means not formal study at all, but there's so many books now at uh, any bookstore you go into, uh, collections of beautiful maps of the age of discovery or American history or the Holocaust or lots of other things and just spend time with them and you'll start getting ideas for how you can use them in your own teaching or research. And then I think the last one I think is when you read, when you read novels or poetry or the news, Try to cultivate your own geographical awareness by paying attention to which places are included. And it always helps, as the historical geographer Donald Mining told me once, to read with an atlas by your side. Because then you can check what a newspaper, for example, is talking about um, and which places are dark on the globe, which places do we not hear about. So if that makes sense, um, I think it, it comes down to awareness more than particular skills. Thank you, Anne. Uh, I'm going to advance to slide uh, the end slide and let you acknowledge your colleagues, and then we'll conclude for the night. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I said I was going to talk about collaboration, and I did talk about our collaboration with the Holocaust Museum, but all of the images that you've seen have been made by multiple people. This kind of work uh, involves a great deal of collaboration, cooperation. It does become one of the joys of the research. Uh, and I'm very grateful to all of those who have funded our work together. And the juggernaut continues. Watch this space. And thank you so much for joining us tonight, particularly uh, as we as we edge into the holiday season. Uh, I hope things are well in Maine with you and your family. Thank you again for leading tonight's session. Thank you, Andy, and thanks everyone for coming. Take care and happy holidays.